Okay, hey everybody, uh, this is Natalie Nidham. Welcome, Nick. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Kutsi? Kutsia. Kutsia. Okay, great. South African, yeah, Afrikaans. Nice. Um, so, I'm, um, as you guys know, I'm a holistic nutritionist, I'm an epigenetic and human potential coach, and I love having these interviews with experts in other areas to talk about um, things that can positively affect our biology, our longevity, our performance, and red light, of course, is a massive topic in this area. So Nick, thank you so much for agreeing to be here. Um, I'm going to introduce Nick a tiny bit. I'm going to read his, his, I don't know, bio here, which is crazy. So I, you've got a, Nick's got a bachelor of science in sports science. He then went on to get an, on a bachelor of science, did an honors in biokinetics. Is that it? Another undergraduate yeah. degree, honors by, in biokinetics, then studied human biomechanics. Mm -hmm. And then from there, um, it sounds like the first thing that you did is you started a company around blue blocking glasses, right? Called Red Panda Therapy. And you can tell us a little bit about where that's gone. And then I guess staying in the same area, right? All about light. Obviously, you've been fascinated by the effect of light on human physiology for a long time. You then are the founder and CEO of Myochondria, which is what we're talking about today, which is an educational platform on light and health. So I'm super fascinated about this whole educational platform thing because clearly you're selling some amazing red light devices. Um, and then the other thing in your bio that I was curious about was this whole area of functional patterns. This is another kind of area of your education that you've delved into that's gotten you to where you are today. So I am now going to stop talking and let you get a word in edgewise. Talk to us next. Perfect. Yeah, thanks for having me, Natalie. I'm really, really excited to speak to um, your group. You've got a, a lot of very educated members. It's quite nice that we can, you know, get a bit more into the, the science of a lot of these things. Um, so my, my original, uh, when I started working, um, I was a biokineticist, and um, that's quite uh, well known in South Africa. Um, overseas, it might be something more similar to a kinesiologist. Yeah. Um, but basically what we do is we treat any kind of condition, you know, whether someone's uh, blown their ACL, or if they've had a stroke, we treat that with, med uh, with exercise. So the slogan that uh, Biokinetics has is exercise is medicine. Um, and from there, I went and studied as a human biomechanics specialist, and that was through the company Functional Patterns. Um, and what I realized, they've got a, a very different approach where it's not just exercise. And I think most people are aware already, you know, exercise is not the only component of optimal health. Um, and that's when my eyes really opened to these other aspects of health. And one of them was our light environment. Uh, you know, like exercise is important and obviously things like diet are really important. Uh, but what I found is that where people are lacking the most and where the area that we don't focus on enough is our light environment. Uh, so originally that's why I started with uh, the Blue Blocker company. Um, and for those of you who don't know Blue Blocker glasses, they simply uh, block out blue wavelengths um, at nighttime from things like your cell phones and laptops. Uh, there we go. <laughs> You've got yours on. And um, Not in the middle of the day, though, I'm taking them off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't want to fall asleep in our interview. No. Um, and that basically helps you to sleep. So, on the one side of the equation, um, you know, we've figured you're getting too much blue light um, just working under artificial lighting. And then on the other side was what are we missing? And that's when I figured out uh, well, red light therapy is basically supplementing your light environment um, in order to balance out, you know, kind of the lifestyle that we're living today. Nice. Yeah. And I think, you know, what a lot of, and it's interesting because there was recently an article posted by another um, kind of friend of mine in this space. And I mean, I stopped wearing sunglasses years ago and this whole, which I think sunglasses exacerbates the issue of excess artificial blue light exposure during the day in that I think what people are, are often don't understand is this natural cycle of light that happens outside and we are completely flipping it over on its head by blocking the blue light during, like the little time you are outside, you're throwing on these sunglasses, you're blocking the blue light that your pineal gland needs to regulate your circadian cycle. And then you're, and then you're coming in at night and turning on the TV and turning on the white lights and now giving yourself the blue light at the exact time that you don't need it, which is, like the paradox is there and the contradictions, it's no wonder that our physiologies are kind of kind of spinning, trying to figure out, okay, where am I and which side is up? 
Absolutely. You know, that's one of the biggest problems with artificial lighting is that up until you know, we invented the light bulb, um, our light environment was a very good signal for what time of day it is. Yeah. And as you mentioned, you know, your circadian rhythm, um, that basically optimizes your body so that you're performing certain um, you know, processes at the right time of day. You don't want to be digesting food at the same time while you're trying to repair um, muscle or something like that. Everything's optimized for a certain time of day. And yeah. so the problem is now, no matter what artificial lighting uh, you try and you know, create in your indoor home or anything like that, the, the main problem with it is that it's constant. So it means that you're going to be hitting one signal all the time and you're not going to get that varying sig signal across the day. And okay. you know, with, with artificial lighting, the problem is it's, we've optimized lighting so that it all falls within the visible spectrum. Um, so that's you know, all the way from blue to the other end of red. But we've, you know, in order to make light bulbs more efficient, we've excluded things like ultraviolet light and then even the infrared, uh, which you would have even originally gotten with like your incandescent bulbs. But the newer bulbs, just to be more energy efficient uh, for our electrical grid, not our bodies, uh, we've cut out all of those types of light. So on both ends of the spectrum, you know, UV light is something we're definitely not getting enough of. Um, and again, when you're using sunglasses, you're going to be uh, blocking that out. And then on the other side, uh, the infrared and even the reds, we don't tend to get enough of uh, from artificial lighting. So yeah, exactly like you said, if you're going outside something like sunglasses, you're, you're actually just going to be making the problem worse. I always found it so interesting that with blue blocker glasses, there was so much education and it, it, it's really strange to think that people don't question putting on sunglasses to block natural lighting outside. Right? <laughs> but you, you, you tell them that you're wearing a pair of glasses to block out what's coming from your computer and, and you're a nut. You've know, you got to put a tinfoil hat on yeah. and block something like that. It's very, yeah, very interesting. Well, it's, I think part of it has to do with the, the perceived cool factor, right? Like you look cool in a pair of sunglasses and you look like a goof wearing these things walking around the house at night. And it's all, I think it's about us normalizing, coming to a new normal and people understanding what the... Um, you know, what the consequences are. I mean, I spend a lot of time with my clients just, you know, even just getting them to get the TV out of their bedroom or turning off their phone or for the love of all that is holy, please do not turn on your phone at three o'clock in the morning when you wake up and you can't sleep. Like, stop it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? And I mean, you know, and, and I mean, the good news is there's definitely... There we have more and more apps and tools that can help us to hack it and make it a little better. Like I've got this app, I'm sure you've got something, it or something similar called Iris on my laptop. Yeah, with, mine's on. My, yeah, exactly. Like it needs to be, right? So as the day goes on, your the, the backlight on your computer starts to change. And what I've done, which I think the next generation, like I have a 19 year old son in university and I've been harping at him about this stuff for the last few years. He has Iris on his computer. He will even sometimes have it on the biohacker setting, which is ridiculous. Like now yeah. you're looking at a red screen <laughs> at night, but because he's working through the night, like into the night, like university kind of puts you in that impossible situation. But I think that if we can start to get people's minds around it so that wearing these, these around at night to protect your sleep um, is no longer so weird, um, and educating kids so that it becomes normal to them. We hopefully in the next few years, we'll start to, it'll be less of an uphill slog as it were. So anyway, this is all great. But um, so we've talked a little, I mean, my first question for you really was where in your opinion does light fit in with respect to optimizing human health? And we've kind of talked about that a little bit. I think that, you know, to summarize, it's about maintaining a healthy circadian rhythm. And, and to me, the circadian rhythm is a little bit like, knocking that first domino in the chain and allowing a whole chain reaction of good things to happen. What's your, I mean, do you have anything to add to that? What's your point of view on that? Uh Oh, are we frozen? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, let's set your circadian rhythm. The, the German word uh, Zeitgeber, which means time giver um, is referred to anything that sets your circadian rhythm. And that can be things like body temperature, uh, meal timing, exercise uh, and light. And yeah. The most important from all of those, the, the, the strongest factor is light. And unfortunately, you know, that's the one that we're messing with the most now with artificial uh, lighting. And that's why we're seeing, you know, so many uh, people with these, you know, common uh, circadian mismatches, things like um, being sleep, like not getting good sleep at night um, or being tired during the day. 
that's, that's just a common sign to show you that your body's not, uh, it, it hasn't optimized its internal clocks. Perfect. So, okay, so now let's get to the nut of it. Uh, let's talk about how these red light therapy panels. So one of the things that, so myochondria sounds to me like it has a dual, um, a dual mission, as it were. One is education, and the other one is to you've create you've built these red light pan these red light therapy panels to provide a solution to the problem that's being addressed in the education. So why don't we talk a little bit about these red light panels and how they can help support circadian cycle, and then we'll kind of go from there. Absolutely. So yeah, the, what we realized quite early on is that uh, red light therapy it's not something that you could you know you wouldn't just find this at your local store it does need a lot of education um you know as we were saying now people aren't very informed yet you know wearing blue blockers is still a crazy uh, concept so what we've prioritized now is that we've got groups and we've got email lists and our website's got a whole blog and everything there is just uh, emphasizing uh, education uh, because no one's you know people aren't going to really buy into this and it's it's you're not going to invest in something that you don't really understand. Yep. Um, so what the red light therapy devices basically do, they emit different wavelengths uh, within both the red and infrared um, uh, spectrum. And um, as you, you know, pl the play on words with mitochondria, so it's my mitochondria. I keep writing it as mitochondria. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so what, what the, um, I mean, it's really important to understand because there's so many benefits. I'm sure you've seen if you search something in like the, the peer reviewed articles in the scientific literature, there's so many different um, benefits associated with red light therapy that if, you know, un understanding the mechanism is quite important because otherwise it can come across as, you know, like just some kind of mumbo jumbo or it's made up. It's almost too good to be true. Absolutely. So basically, yeah. So basically what happens is in um, our cells, we have mitochondria and uh, those are basically the powerhouse of our cell often referred to as like the engine of the car. And um, what, what uh, we found with research is that the mitochondria respond uh, very specifically uh, to certain wavelengths of light. So within the red range, there's two um, kind of peaks. Uh, one of them is around 630 nanometers, the other is around 660 nanometers. And those both stimulate a certain enzyme within your mitochondria to produce more ATP. Then there's another one in the infrared range, and that's around 850 nanometers. And that does the same thing, also stimulates um, the cytochrome C, which helps the mitochondria make more ATP. So when you see that there's so many benefits associated with it, I always give the example is that if you had a doctor and a, a sportsman and an engineer, and you gave them all a whole bunch more energy, they'd be able to do each of their individual tasks, regardless of what they were. Right. So that's why you see so many benefits. You know, it's like things like inflammation, uh, better muscle recovery, just because the light that you're giving your body is feeding those cells and at a very basic level, providing them with more energy uh, to do their function. What we find with the differences in wavelengths, so like the 630 versus 660, the red range, those ones don't tend to penetrate as deeply. Um, so those ones have the biggest benefit for like skin, you know, improved collagen, um, you know, decreased wrinkles. And then with the longer wavelengths, um, like the near infrared 850 nanometer, uh, that's when you start penetrating like 15 up to even 30 centimeters through your tissues. And that gets to things like your gut biome uh, or like joint issues um, and really helps with things like inflammation uh, in those kind of areas. Okay. Oh, that's really interesting. So the, the deeper, um, the deeper, the, 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 the spectrum that goes deep, um, will it go as deep as bone? And does a person's fat mass have to do with like, will it affect how deep it get? It can get. I mean, just you know what I mean. Like someone who's got quite a lot of weight to lose. Let's say we can see we can see how upregulating mitochondria I think also has metabolic benefits. Does it not? I mean, I mean, my upregulating mitochondria as a rule will have metabolic benefits. But are you seeing that? Because I know that when I first got my red light panel way, way back, I was like, you know, I went nutty for it. I was doing 20 minutes a day. Um, and within a couple of weeks, and I think it was all inflammation, like I dropped a couple of pounds. And, and you know, my gut was that it was just inflammation leaving the body at some level. Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's a couple of reasons. There's so many factors, but obviously fat itself is alive. So if you're increasing the metabolism there, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be upregulating uh, your metabolic rate. But the other thing you've said, you know, is inflammation is 
it's probably one of the biggest issues we have these days is most of us are walking around, you know, till the tilt covered or, you know, full of information. And if you have that kind of stress in your body, if you've got a constant uh, like inflammation, your body's going to take that as a signal that it's probably not a good idea to um, get rid of too much fat. I mean, if you think about it, if you were in the wild and you had an injury, yeah. let's say you, you broke your leg or something like that, your body's going to, you know, your, your brain's going to say, okay, we're not going to be able to get up and go and gather some food for a while. Uh, so let's maybe hang on to some of our fat stores and probably break down things like muscle before we break down any fat. So as soon as you can deal with something like inflammation and deal with those stress hormones, then it's a lot more likely that your body is going to tap into uh, those fat stores and get you to a healthier weight. It's not in kind of a, a fight or flight response. Right, right. Yeah. So getting out of that. So just so going back to that. So will the so assuming you know reasonable body composition, because somebody was asking in the group about helping to heal uh, a fracture, for example. So in my mind, I mean, fractures, what comes to my mind quickly is obviously optimizing your nutrition, essential amino acids, collagen, um, PEMF, like pulse, pulsed electromagnetic uh, frequencies can be very helpful in, in helping the bone to come back together. Uh, there are certain peptides that can help, but does red light play a role in this mechanism beyond just helping to manage excess inflammation? Um, yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, the one factor is gonna be inflammation. Yeah. And I think it's also important to explain that because what inflammation basically is, is your body dealing with um, damaged cells. Yeah. Um, and what red light has the ability to do because it's providing um, certain cells with more energy, those cells are basically going to be healthier. So one of the, 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 the signs for uh, inflammation is that we get these things called cytokines. Yeah. And this is basically your, your immune system's way of tagging a damaged cell. So when, what we find is when the cell uh, has more energy and you're providing it with red and infrared wavelengths, um, less of these cytokines are present. So basically your body is preserving uh, more of the cells and, not, you know, and that's the kind of reason why you don't get as much inflammation. The other thing with bones, you're going to have uh, fibroblasts. They're going to be laying down collagen and uh, they've got mitochondria within them, exactly the same thing. Uh, they respond to uh, more uh, red and infrared light and they're going to be able to do their task better. Um, what you mentioned about bone, I was just thinking about it now. I'm reading a book at the moment that's uh, it's called The Body Electric. Uh -huh. I don't know if you've read it, but right in the beginning, he talks about um, the, the interesting thing is about these, you know, some fractures heal and then we get these non-union fractures. And right. we don't really know exactly why that happens um, with, with some people. Uh, but one of the things that the research goes on to find is that it has a lot to do with the uh, current that is going through your body. And what's really important to understand is that we're basically big batteries and yeah. uh, we have these electrical currents going through us and what the electric current is is basically electrons moving within our body yeah. and uh, photons of light have a have the ability to raise these electrons and actually raise your electrical potential mm -hmm. so if you think of let's say you've got a bone injury and there's a risk for it being a non-union fracture if you're going to have a better energy current in that area then you're going to be giving it a much better chance uh, in order to heal. So tell us a little bit, what is a young, I don't, you know, I've heard the term non-union fracture. Mm -hmm. Can you? It's can basically you just where the, the bone decides not to do anything. So um, just, so it just sometimes, sits there. Yeah, so I've actually, I actually had one um, when I, I fractured my shoulder about five years ago mm -hmm. um, and they left it for about two weeks. They basically give it a chance to see if it'll heal. So I had the, um, it's called the greater tubercle. It's one part of the yeah. bone lifted right off and they gave it a chance two weeks. They did x-rays and after two weeks it hadn't done anything. So that's when they go in with a, uh, like I've got an aluminum um, pin. They nice. put that in and then that sets the bone in place. It's a very unpredictable um, thing that happens within the human body. Uh, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. We don't fully understand it. Um, but the book I know I'm reading at the moment, they kind of, uh, what they always notice is that there's a much healthier current uh, within the body when a, when a fracture does actually uh, right. heal properly. Well, and that's where I guess PEMF would come in because there's definite, there's some really interesting studies in that area. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what uh, made me think of that, that the getting the current, the, the current right. Yeah. 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 Interesting. And then red light plays a role in that as well. Yeah. So okay. phot photons have the ability to take, so within our bodies, we have uh, electrons. They at rest, um, we call that ground state. And what happens is when a photon of light, if it is at the right frequency, 
uh, interacts with that electron, it can take it from ground state into um, an excited state. Yeah. And that means that that electron has potential energy, so it can do some kind of uh, work in the body. But what's really important to understand is that when a photon of light comes in, let's say it's red, and it hits uh, an electron that is ready to receive red light, it can excite that um, electron to a higher energy state. And that, that electron then, when it drops down to a ground state, it doesn't necessarily have to emit uh, red light. So what can happen is you can get red light hitting you at a certain part of your uh, body, and then that, as that electron drops down, you could be releasing a bit of green, a bit of blue, whatever it is. But the main thing to understand is that our body communicates uh, with light. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's fascinating. That actually brings me to another question. So obviously, if you have an injury, um, you're going to, and we're going to talk a bit more about this in a little while, but you want to focus, if you can, your red light therapy on that site of injury. But let's say somebody's just wanting general systemic benefits of red light therapy, and they've got a panel that is, whether it's a 12 by 12 or a little bit bigger or one of, one of the long, tall panels, um, how important is it to expose all of your, like physically, like, you know, should you be sitting there with your arm up and then your front and then your back and then the other arm and make sure you get your shins and your feet? Or is there a general kind of systemic upregulation, if you will, just from that localized exposure to red light? There's definitely a systemic um, effect, and there's a couple of a couple of um, ways that that could happen. There was actually a study I saw quite recently where it was very interesting. They took a whole bunch of participants and they put a cut on both of their arms, and then they applied uh, red light therapy to one only one of the arms. I love this. And then yeah. the <laughs> control group didn't didn't receive any light. And what they found is that obviously the one that had the arm that had red light therapy on it, let's say it was the left arm, um, that recovered better but they also found that the other arm had an improved recovery rate compared to the control group who didn't receive any red light. So there is some kind of systemic effect, um, whether that's actually because, you know, some of that energy is transferring to the other side or whether that's because you're providing enough energy to the left, therefore the rest of your body can pay more attention to another part of your body. Uh, don't know exactly the mechanism, but that does seem to be the result. Uh, the other thing is, you know, there's, there's things like your gut biome. So if you're yeah. putting a red light on your gut and you're improving your gut, you know, that's going to have systemic effects all the way up to your brain, um, like mental clarity, just because you've um, applied the red light to one part of your body. Uh, and I think it will come back even to what you were saying about inflammation earlier. If you've got a chronic shoulder injury and you've got a whole bunch of inflammation there, your body's going to be diverting so much attention towards that shoulder. As soon as you hit you know, that area with red light and you start decreasing the inflammation, your body's going to be able to tap into all those other, um, you know, processes that are meant to be happening in your body. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the body is very smart, right? It operates on a hierarchy of needs basis. So the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Uh, but once you've resolved that, as you're saying, it's basically freeing up the energy to go do maybe a lower level task that is still nevertheless an imbalance, just not screaming quite as loudly kind of thing. Absolutely. So, yeah. So that's so. So then, would you say that it's probably a good idea for people when they're doing the red light therapy to, as long as there's not some kind of major injury going on, it's probably a good idea to exp to do different areas of your body on different days. Like so, maybe one day you might focus on your midsection. Next day you might do your back. Day after that, you know, maybe more from here up. So you're hitting the thymus, the thyroid, the eyes. Absolutely. I think that's definitely a great idea. I mean, if you're just hitting chest and back, it's almost like a, a gym program. You know, you need to be doing the entire body. Treat it like a gym program. Do chest and back on one day, um, do arms another day, something like that. But yes, because there's a systemic effect and because if you keep hitting one area and that's the only part you hit every day, it does kind of adapt to that. And then, you know, the, you're almost going to get more bang for your buck by hitting another area of your body because that's the one that's lagging behind. And exactly like we're talking now about the systemic um, effect definitely okay. uh, moving it across body parts what i will say though is where you see a lot of benefits is getting the red light on areas of your body which we don't tend to get enough of and that's obviously what we're covering with clothing so chest and back really important um, i'm sure a lot of people have probably seen there's that um, article in the men's health uh, with the biohacker ben greenfield he put the red light on his uh, junk oh my and God. He talks about it all the time yeah so that, that, that's very interesting. I mean, uh, there have been studies in the past where they used uh, natural lighting 
And um, I remember seeing one where they took, uh, they put light on the guy's chests and back and they increased testosterone by 120%. And when they put it on the testes, then they saw improvements of 200%. And that's obviously because, you know, 99% of testosterone is made uh, in the male testes. Yeah. And that's one area, you know, we're not getting enough uh, lighting exposure to. Not much at all. So, no. you know, in those studies offhand, you know how old the test subjects were? I'm curious about that because, you know, in general, testosterone levels, there's a lot of talk in the literature right now how, in general, testosterone levels are dropping even in younger men. Um, and I know that when I was in, in school studying holistic nutrition, they were talking about how they've had to, in fertility clinics, they've had to lower the benchmark for sperm counts because what we're seeing is that young men today have, like, I, I don't even remember what the percentage was, but it was slightly appalling a vastly lower number at baseline of sperm than their dads would have at their age, um, which has probably got to do, I mean, with so many things, possibly EMFs and toxins and environment and stress and who knows, you know, BPA, like there's, the list is endless really of what could be causing that. But I'm just wondering that increase, that 300% in those studies, do you have any sense of how old those, those subjects were? Because I mean, there are legions of 50 and 60 year olds right now that will be, and even 70 year olds that would pay big money to bump up their testosterone without having to, you know, do the creams, dreams and injections, which yeah. will happen as well. But And also, you know, a non-invasive testosterone replacement therapy is a very invasive thing and it has some side effects. Um, you know, now, now you're putting in exogenous uh, testosterone into your body. Uh, but regarding the age, I don't know the specific age of that study, the one that I know was referenced, Ben Greenfield is about 32, as far as I know. Uh, but I actually, when we first started, now. yeah, when we started with uh, with red light therapy, we took one of the um, prototypes. And my business partner at the time, he was 30. He was 30 at the time we did this. We went and got a whole bunch of blood work done, and uh, we went to a GP. And uh, the GP that we went to was actually a testosterone uh, specialist. He was giving a whole bunch of guys, you know, testosterone replacement therapy. And we did a test. We took his testosterone. And uh, for two weeks, he would, for 15 minutes, sit in front of one of our prototype red lights um, with his genitals in front of it. And at the end of two weeks, it was, he went from 11 point something, um, I can't remember the exact measurements, to 17 something. It was about a 50% increase in testosterone. And when we went back to the doctor because he tested this, he actually said he wouldn't have been able to get results that quickly if he'd been injecting testosterone. He said the body wouldn't have actually taken in um, the testosterone that quickly that you would see improvements uh, within two weeks. So that is anecdotal, but you know, if, I think if you're getting improvements um, with people that are the age of 28, 30, and I mean, that's when you shouldn't be having too much issues, although right. it is more and more of a problem these days. Um, I've always, you know, whenever we have customers who say they're buying it for uh, testosterone, great ideas to do some blood work and get it tested uh, before you, you actually do that. Well, because that's so interesting, right? And especially if you're doing the blood work and you're looking at the downstream metabolites as well to understand what's your body doing with that testosterone before you start pumping exogenous testosterone and possibly driving things you don't want. Um, how interesting would it be to, do, to have that blood work done before and after? And even then to compare it to exogenous testosterone, does the body treat that exogenous testosterone differently than it does testosterone that you're producing yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would always, you know, whether it was a 90% increase with red light therapy or 100% increase without, with exogenous, I would rather take the 90%. I mean, as I'm sure you know, there's many uh, negative side effects associated with uh, taking things like testosterone. Absolutely. Uh, from a needle, yeah. And do we know, does it have any positive effect? This I don't know. Does it have positive effect also on women's sex hormones or is it just the testosterone that we, that's been studied so far? I, I have seen studies that show it um, improves fertility. So okay. then I, I'm sure it would have something to do with estrogen. Yeah, um, I, I would definitely definitely say, I mean, fertility is obviously a very hormonal thing. Um, mm -hmm. Stress hormones are definitely, I mean, I know with a lot of women, stress hormones like your things like cortisol, those can throw off um, your, your cycle and those kind of things. Um, so if you're dealing with, if there's any kind of inflammation in a certain part of your body um, that's actually causing, uh, that the the cycle issue then absolutely yeah actually you know it'd be interesting that's where the back exposure might come into play where you're hitting the kidneys with those little tiny adrenal glands sitting on top like the effect of red light on the endocrine system as we're just talking you know whether it's 
the thyroid or the thymus or the or the adrenals can't be it can't be far off everything else it's doing at the end of the day it's the mitochondria which is so it's so far downstream kind of thing it can only tip things the right way as we move up absolutely yeah. yeah natalie that's why i always start with saying you know before we get into any of the benefits it's, it's good that people have a, a base understanding of the mechanism because it's there's there's so many different benefits that it, it does seem like woo woo until you um so first of all understand the mechanism and then i think it's always a good idea that people go on to like pubmed or one of the you know the scientific literature uh, like journals type in anything that you're looking for you know whether that's um improved uh, information or uh, better skin more collagen and just type in whatever you're looking for and red light therapy or and photobiomodulation which is another name for it and uh, you're bound to find uh, some kind of result. And it's also really important that people do that, I think, because what we do with our panels is we give every single spec about you know, the wavelength, um, the power density, and um, you know, what kind of uh, dosage you're getting per minute at varying yeah. distances. And what's really nice is a lot of people find that they want to, you know, a lot of guys, say, for instance, want to replicate a study um, in order to improve hair growth. And they'll, if you go into the, the studies, you can actually go, and find under the methodology, they'll say they delivered 20 joules uh, once a day for six weeks. And you'll be able to figure out with one of our panels how you can replicate that in order to you know, get the same benefit for yourself. That's fantastic. That's, that's actually great because I know that there's definitely, I can think of at least one and possibly two of the players in the market that are not quite as forthcoming about their specs, wavelengths and that kind of thing. It's, you know, it's labeled under proprietary information, which I think does a disservice not only just to the user, but it does a disservice in many ways to the industry because it keeps it shrouded kind of in this, I don't know, this mystery where when we're trying to deal with health and improving health conditions, there's no room for that anymore. You know, people need to understand what they're doing and why. And, and to your point, being able to go into PubMed, look at a study and try to replicate that study for yourself um, is an incredibly powerful and especially to when we're talking to a population of biohackers, so people who are willing and able to take control of their own biology and do this stuff for themselves, this is a pretty, it's a pretty powerful thing to be able to do. So thank yeah, you for doing that. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk a little bit, and we talked about this a bit offline, and I know that it's a very, um, it's a very kind of, it's a very sensitive, discussion we know that red light therapy and infrared light so photobiomodulation just to keep it simple um has huge benefits for the skin in terms of collagen production um reducing wrinkles of course you're going to improve collagen production everything's going to go from there um but there's also some talk about how it can help the body the skin to to be protected and to adapt to sunlight right and so of course sun has become the big demon in the sky which we know it is not. I mean, obviously, if you're going to lie out there between 10 and 2 covered in oil with your reflector, possibly not a good idea. <laughs> but, you know, normal exposure through the day has a massive, and never mind it has benefits, it's vital to our body. So the question that comes up quite often, and I know even in the literature, it's pretty fuzzy, this whole issue of if people have an active melanoma or squamous cell carcinoma, so some kind of a cancer state, what I've read is, and I mean, it kind of makes sense. Again, when we go back to the, the, way, the way it acts, the mitochondrial activation, the photobiomodulation is not going to be selective. So the cancer cell, you could argue, could potentially benefit from this upregulation in energy as well. But in the absence of an active cancer, I think the consensus is that it's pretty much considered safe. Do you have an opinion if somebody has a history of these things? Like, what are your thoughts there? And I know you can't give a full on, like there's no absolute here. So everybody take it with a grain of salt, do your homework. <laughs> so yeah, the, the first thing that you mentioned about, um, you know, the, the demon in the sky and the sun, you know, ultraviolet light is the type of light that we associate with burning and also with, with things like skin cancer with excessive exposure. Um, the problem is it's not entirely bad. You know, as you mentioned, there's a whole bunch of really important processes that happen um, when you're exposed to ultraviolet light. You know, without them, we wouldn't be able to convert uh, cholesterol into vitamin D, uh, which, is, which is actually a hormone. Most people just think of it as a vitamin. It's a very essential hormone um, in our bodies. 
we need ultraviolet in order to make melatonin. And that's something that's a very powerful antioxidant and also make sure that you're getting a really good quality sleep. So ultraviolet isn't all that bad. What the problem is, is that we're not preparing our skin enough um, for ultraviolet light. So what, ha what, what would happen in nature is in the morning for the first few hours, you probably wouldn't get any ultraviolet light, but you would still be getting at least 42% of um, the infrared A wavelengths. Yep. Um, so that is whether you're on the equator in the middle of the day um, and on a hot sunny day or whether you're in uh, the UK where we are now and it's a cloudy day, you're always going to have at least 42% infrared A. And what infrared, uh, the infrared wavelengths do is they act as a signal to uh, basically warn your skin that there's going to be some harsh light uh, later in the day. So it helps to activate um, the melanin within your skin so that you absorb UV light better and that you don't burn. So essentially what we're doing now is, you know, people are going out into the middle, people only go out when they think they're going to get a tan yes. and in the middle of the day, they go outside into the sun. And yeah, that's the equivalent of rocking up for the Wimbledon finals and you've never held a tennis racket. You know, you've exactly. got to prepare yourself for it. Um, and you're slathering on this sunscreen that's filled with carcinogens, which is a whole yeah. other discussion. But Absolutely. So, um, you know, in, in nature, what you should be doing is getting full body exposure in the mornings, uh, watching the sunrise and getting that infrared um, exposure. But that's also where the red light therapy comes in, is that if you can do that, you know, it's obviously a lot easier. Uh, we'll never say that we're better than the sun. You know, this, we always say sunlight is your first choice. If you can go out and get natural sun, you're going to get complete full spectrum light. Um, but for those of you who, you know, the convenience of being able to get naked, uh, it's a lot more legal inside your own home. Uh, you can use the red and infrared to help prepare yourself uh, for ultraviolet light later in the day. On the other side of that, ultraviolet light is really, you know, it's, it's a very short wavelength, so it can um, do a bit of damage to the cells. Um, but one of the very clever repair mechanisms that your body has is at the end of the day when the sun is setting, you're going to be then again exposed to more of the red wavelengths, which is going to help deal with that inflammation and bring you back full cycle. So you're preparing yourself for the, the ultraviolet light during the day, you're absorbing it then really well, and at the end of the day, you're kicking in those repair mechanisms in order to make sure you're not doing any um, extra damage. With the... Um, you know, the cancer, you know, if someone does have some kind of uh, carcinoma or something, it is, it is um, you know, there's some research that says it could upregulate the cancer cells. Um, you know, in my, in my own logic, I would think that if you were out in nature and you had cancer, you know, if you were getting any kind of sunlight at any time of day, that means it would make it worse. Um, but, you know, where we are currently, we don't give any kind of strict uh, recommendations. If someone does have something like that, it's always best that they, you know, seek medical advice and, and speak to their, you know, their, their um, physician um, and see what, what he or she recommends. Um, but it is probably one of the, one of the only uh, contraindications to just jumping into red light therapy. I mean, there really aren't uh, adverse, you know, you hardly ever hear of any kind of adverse uh, side effects from using a red light therapy device. Um, but we're just at that stage where we don't give a, we, we're not going to say that we're going to cure cancer with um, our devices just yet. <laughs> No, no. And the skin cancer, I think, is the one that is probably the most sensitive. I mean, you could argue probably for anything. But um, anyway, yeah, no, I, I had a feeling that's what you were going to say. And so basically to exercise common sense and, uh, and, some, and some caution around it. But yeah, uh, and I think also to do, do your research. I mean, unfortunately, common sense these days is to apply sunscreen and SPF 50 sunscreen all the time and never go out in the sun. Yeah. But um, I think people also need to do their own due diligence. Um, you know, if, if you think about uh, how our ancestors would have lived, they never got cancer at such high rates as we do now. Um, and, you know, these things do pop up with, as you said, carcinogenic sunscreens. Um, you know, even if you are going to use a sunscreen, be aware of what kind of sunscreen you're going to use. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, there's, there's also the question, why do most, um, you know, skin cancers pop up in areas that we have covered? Why is it normally on the body um, that these kind of things pop up? Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of money behind research, and um, you know, there's always going to be uh, two sides of the story, and you can you can find something to back up whichever you uh, want to believe. I think just use use your common sense, and um, yeah, you'll prevail through that. Yeah, there's a you know for people who are interested, there's a really great website called uh, ewg.org. I think it's environmentalworkinggroup.org. And they have this really great database. I think it's called Skin Deep. And they rank um, 
all skincare products, including sunscreens, from least to most toxic. And so there are some reasonable options out there for people who are concerned, who maybe have to spend more time than they would want to in midday sun. Um, and um, I find that that website, I, there's, a, there's a sunscreen that I've been using for the last couple of years when I've needed it. It's called Think Sport. Um, and it's a mineral sunscreen, so it's not, it's, it's free of a lot of the nasty chemicals. And I mean, you know, there's a real, like I live in Canada, so it's the middle of the winter. If I get a week off, I mean, this year we're going to Europe, but normally I'd be hustling myself over to Costa Rica. It's again, it's that shock from no sun to crazy sun from one day to the next that is really where people start to get into trouble. And I actually think there was a study at one point that talked about it's actually worse to get that intermittent shock of screen of sun than it is to have for people who live in a more moderate climate where they have constant exposure through the year. Uh, abso I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I completely believe the sun is good for us, but that shock to the system, it's that Wimbledon final that you're just uh, rocking up to. I would say for you, Natalie, you, know, if you know that you're going to be going away to somewhere where there's a lot more sun, you know, really dial in on your red light therapy, maybe do it even twice a day. Um, yeah. you know, morning and evening and get those red and infrared um, wavelengths. And that's going to help to, you know, prepare your skin and build up your, they call it your solar callus. Um, so that when you do go out in the sun, whether you're going to Greece or wherever it is, um, your body's going to be a bit more prepared to deal with uh, that UV light. Great. Okay. Well, you, you know what, you just led into the, something that I think a lot of people are going to be wondering about. So what would you be, what would you say is your ideal protocol for red light there for photomodulation? in a typical day for most people. And we can talk about if you have an injury or if you're just looking for general systemic benefits as we've been talking about, whether it's the collagen, the microbiome, the inflammation, all that stuff. Yeah, so the, the common question that happens is, you know, what time of day? Yeah. Um, the, t the two times a day which are probably the best are your morning, which is when you're gonna be getting like the sunrise and then in the evening again with sunset. Um, and obviously that's, you know, we spoke earlier about if you are getting ultraviolet light, uh, you know, normal sunlight exposure, that's where it's going to help both before and after. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the morning, it also really helps to just rather be using a red light. I mean, we even have on our bigger device, we have um, switches so that you can flick off between the red and the infrared. Obviously, the infrared uh, wavelength you can't see. Yeah. So what happens, you know, you can switch both of them on when you want to do a treatment, but then switch off the infrared and actually use red as a light source in the morning just because you don't want to be setting your circadian rhythm with, uh, you know, some kind of artificial blue light. So getting that red, red in the morning is going to be a, a much better idea. And then when you can get outside into natural light, use that as the way to set your circadian clock. The problem with setting your circadian clock under artificial lighting, so if you're getting, uh, let's say, the blue light from a cell phone, is that it doesn't necessarily correlate to morning time. So if right. you're looking at, you know, the first thing you do and you wake up in the morning is you look at your cell phone and you get that um, high concentration of bright blue light through your eyes that's going to be signaling to your brain more like um, mid-noon. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're basically starting your day with uh, it's lunchtime, the middle yeah. of the day. And then six hours later, people wonder why they get tired in the afternoon. It's because mm -hmm. they've started their clock, you know, six hours ahead of where they were uh, meant to. So morning, great time in order to get a bit more red. Um, if you do have any blue light in your environment, it's also good to be um, having that with red light. Um, you know, as we say, blue light isn't completely bad. You should be getting blue light. It does help set your circadian rhythm in the morning. Um, but nature would never expose you to, com to blue light on its own, which we're able to do with um, modern technology. So if you are getting any blue light exposure, you know, um, adding in a bit of red light is really good because then you've got that really stimulating blue and then you've got the repair mechanism uh, with the red and infrared that nature would have been giving you in an ideal situation anyway, um, just to make sure that you're not going, you know, pure blue. So my, my general thing, what I do in the morning, first thing we do is we switch, switch on the red light and we do, you know, our, we do like a bit of um, foam rolling or a fascia release. I'm sure you've heard of fascia release. Yeah. And that's obviously just to do Speaking with what, my age. It's all I do. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's basically a lot of the things I've learned through functional patterns um, is to do with hydrating your tissues. So if you can wake up in the morning and really hydrate your tissues with both uh, fascia release and with a bit of red light therapy, just means you're going to flush out, you know, any toxins that are in your body from um, the, the sleep. Yeah. And, you know, that's going to be a, a much better way to start than having a double espresso, you know, coffee.
staring so at morning, you. <laughs> morning gaps normally a really good idea. Uh, a lot of people will do it at slightly different times of day, especially if they're active. Um, so immediately after exercise, it's a really good idea to do red light therapy because that's going to help um, increase the blood flow. Um, it inc increases the nitric oxide. So it means that after exercise, you're going to be able to flush out you know, any metabolites that have built up um, through your exercise program. Really, it's not, it's not too damaging. I mean, well, it's not actually damaging to do red light therapy, say, for instance, at the wrong, the wrong time of day. Um, mm -hmm. The only time I would say isn't really a good idea is within like an hour or two before you're going to go to bed. Just because any bright light, you know, no matter what color it is, can have some kind of um, stimulatory effect on your brain. You know, especially if you're holding it up to your face, it could be it could be red. That's still going to be able to, you know, stimulate your brain to some degree. So I I would say any time of day, uh, preferably morning and evening, uh, but not too close to bedtime is ideal. That's interesting. So so then in the evening you're talking about around five, around sunset basically. So five six, depending on the, I mean here. Our sun sets anywhere between five and nine, depending on the time of year, right? So, um, so, so you're saying for most people, though, around five or six p.m. in the evening would be roughly as late as you'd want to go. I would adjust it according to your season. So, as you said, you know, if, if your sunset is around five or five p.m., then do it around that time. If your sunset is later on, then you know, shift your your schedule. Um, you know, there's no ideal waking up time and there's no ideal going to, to bedtime that you should stick to throughout the, throughout the year. You know, we are meant to go through times where we have longer light cycles and we are meant to go through times where we have shorter light cycles. Unfortunately, what we, we do tend to do is just stay with longer light cycles all year round because of artificial lighting. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you've got to shift your schedule, that's completely normal. Um, and I think that's actually the better way to do it than to try and sit down and say, okay, 7 p.m., for the entire year, I'm going to make sure that I do my session at that exact uh, time. Yeah, well, and it's interesting because in the summertime, at least here, and I mean, it's probably the same in the UK because you do have a winter of sorts, is that it, we're more likely to be outside at sunset because you want to be outside at sunset. You know, you want to, whereas now when it's, you know, minus 10 or 15 degrees Celsius, the last thing you want to be is outside at sunset. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, that's, one of the hard, that's one of the hardest things because, you know, I mean, obviously I've I'm promoting myself as, you know, someone in the light industry. Unfortunately, you should actually be getting outside, you know, whether that's two degrees or 30 degrees, getting yourself outside at sunrise and sunset um, and getting natural lighting is going to be probably one of the most important things you can do for your health. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I have a dog, so that helps. I have no choice. There we go. Yeah, it's not your decision. <laughs> exactly. It's much less of a decision. Okay, let's see. I think we've covered a lot of grounds, but I think there's a few other things um okay so i had another question here so we have red light therapy or photobiomodulation as a foundation are there any um like do you add any supplementation in your world to kind of as a stack like we all like to stack in our, in this industry we like to do this and that and that and that to optimize benefits um is there do you typically supplement with mitochondrial support yourself beyond the red light therapy do you mean do you mean lights or do you mean actual food supplements i mean actual food supplements i don't take any um like supplements that i you know that are uh, let's say away from natural food i do try and, and get more natural food yeah. uh, one of the things that i do put a lot of focus on though is dha one of yeah. the types of omega threes um for anyone who's familiar with jack cruz uh, he's this he's the light expert and he's basically come up with uh what he calls the epi paleo diet so the paleo diet, as I'm sure everyone knows, is based on how our ancestors lived. Yeah. Uh, one of the obvious, obvious flaws with that way of thinking is that we don't live exactly like our ancestors did. So what his epi-paleo diet does is it focuses on, you know, what you should be eating in order to offset the environment that you're living in now. One of the problems with a, a lot of blue light exposure is that it destroys um, the cell membranes, uh, which are made primarily of DHA. Yeah. And one of the one what a very important um, process that can happen on uh, in your cell membrane is you know as I was saying to you earlier how light can change just because the difference between blue and red is literally the frequency or the length of the the, the wavelength. Yeah. And what happens is if you get um, blue light exposure and it, it um, hits your cell membrane, your membrane can actually slow down the speed of that blue light and change it to red light before it hits your mitochondria within your cell. So if you're getting chronic blue light exposure 
and you want to you know add something to your diet epi paleo then uh you know eating a lot more fish like fatty fish that's high in dha things also like oysters um those are really good just to offset um the blue light uh the exposure that you're getting so in terms of food that's something i do i try and eat a lot more oysters and, and fatty fish but um, specific supplements, uh, nothing that I would stack with red, uh, red light. Um, I would stack other types of light. And I, I thought that was maybe what you were asking. Okay, um, well then I'm happy to hear that answer as well. <laughs> yeah, so this is obviously a very, you know, this is a very individual thing. You've got to figure out, you know, where in the world you're living. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, you also want to, you know, we spoke, there's a visible spectrum. We're getting exposed to a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, we don't tend to get enough of the red and infrared on the one side and on the other end is a UV light, mm -hmm. which can be broken down into different components as UVA and UVB. Um, I also try and use a UVA light. Um, that's not the type that shouldn't really cause any kind of burning, um, but that's a good um, idea to have in your room is just to get, use that as a natural light so people can look into um, what's called a black light bulb. And you'll find um, these lights that basically emit a UVA light and you can combine that with red or infrared or even like incandescent bulbs that we'll be using uh, just to get a bit of a fuller spectrum indoors. At the end of the day, it's not better than um, being outside, but if you do have to live inside, whatever you do, don't live under like these white fluorescent or um, LEDs. Bright, bright white LEDs. Uh, you know, if you can change that and supplement your lighting environment, um, doing things like incandescent bulbs or using red um, light, or even, as I said, the UVA light, UVB, is um, a type of light I probably wouldn't recommend anyone to use unless you have something like psoriasis and you're using it to treat. Mm -hmm. um, UVB light is very specific to season and where, on, where in the world you're living if you're closer to the equator. And I think people can do a lot more damage um, if they start using things like a UVB light at the wrong times of year um, mm -hmm. and they're just going to cause like some kind of circadian mismatch. So for me, I would say stick to um, the, if you're gonna be changing your, your um, internal light environment, stick to the things that aren't gonna cause any harm. Red and infrared, you're gonna get your most bang for the buck. And then if you want to look into something like a, a black light uh, UVA bulb, uh, that's probably also something you could look into. So the black light bulb, would you have that in your bedroom and basically use it in the, kind of in the lead up to bedtime kind of thing? Or would you have uh, that? You, no, I wouldn't use it specific. So um, if you, you need to look into what type of black light you get. Um, so UVA falls between 315 and 400 nanometers. Mm -hmm. Most of the black lights won't actually start at 315. They start at around 340. Yeah. But if you can find one that starts at 315, that's the specific wavelength that um, sets uh, starts the process to make melatonin at night. So UVA light, I would use it any time uh, during the day. When it's uh, light outside, you can use a UVA uh, light inside just as an extra um, you know, addition to your light environment. So you're not getting that single signal that we, we right. said right in the beginning. So almost having like a lamp in your office with this bulb in it as part of the mix, like the, soup, yeah. the light soup that you're sitting in. Yeah. Um, and so would you have your red light panel on during the, like I have like my office has a big window in it. So I get, I mean, although it's filtered through a window, it's not optimal. Yeah. Um, so there's some loss there obviously, but would you have, at a distance, the red light panel on and the UV, the UVA, like just kind of have this, this whole mix of light going on during yeah. the time. Yeah. I mean, the, the re you don't need to go as far as having the red light on all day. Uh, if you are, you know, like, let's say you and I are busy using the Iris app. So we're not getting that chronic blue light exposure. Mm -hmm. It's probably not much, too much of a problem, but if you are, you know, sitting in front of a screen, I know we have a lot of people who are um, graphic designers yeah. and, they can't mess with their screen. You know, Iris is a great concept for us, but they <laughs> need to- It's a disaster that. for color. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everything's red. Yeah. Um, so what a good idea for them is, you know, if you can't get away from blue light exposure, nature would never have given you pure blue light. So adding in that red and infrared, um, you know, is gonna be a really good idea. Even if you, you know, you've got a window out, you're looking through a window, that is probably gonna be blocking some of the um, infrared light that's coming from outside. Um, if, if people want to do a really, really simple start to optimizing their light environment, finding the, the old incandescent bulbs, those wire ones that heat up, those are going to be some of your best bets. I mean, they're, they're much closer to sunset. If you look at a, um, a spectrophotometry test, um, comparing a sunset to incandescent bulb, they're very similar um, profiles with a lot more red and infrared. And, um, you know, one of the reasons we spoke about in the beginning that infrared lights aren't really uh, used these days is because they're not energy efficient. Yeah. And how, have we, how have we made our lights more energy efficient? 
we've narrowed it down to the visible light of spectrum of uh, the visible spectrum of light and cut out everything um, that is not visible to our eye but very visible to you know our body and really important for a lot of other processes so incandescent bulbs is a really simple swap out you can do and for the little bit more that you're going to be paying on your electricity bill you're going to save a lot on uh, medical costs. Yeah, just turn the lights off when you leave the room, for God's sake. You'll be fine. <laughs> You'll save a lot of money. Okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty. I mean, we're coming up on time. I know we said 45 minutes. We're way over that. Um, I guess let's talk about your units and some of the issues that we're seeing that people are talking about. You know, there's definitely a lot of chatter in the space. Everybody's, there's a lot of competition. There's one particular company that's gotten a real stranglehold on the market right now. Um, and they got a jump on the market. They were the, probably the first in or one of the first in. Um, but why don't you, why don't we talk a little bit about this whole issue of flicker, EMF shielding, like the, the issues that can in and of themselves affect the, how effective and beneficial your blue light device is for you and how mitochondria has kind of address that, maybe a little bit about pricing. I, this is gonna be your time to talk about your units. Uh, so let's get into that a little bit, because I know there's a lot of issues around there. Absolutely. So the, the very first one you mentioned uh, is Flickr. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, you know, our electricity grid, depending on where you are in the world, whether it's 50 or 60 uh, gigahertz, we have um, what's called an alternating or AC current, which basically means that your electricity turns off and on at a really rapid rate. So if you took your phone and you did a slow motion video of um, you know, a certain type of light in your house or even some red light therapy devices, uh, you would get a flicker. I believe you actually managed to see it on your device, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but, but some red light therapy devices, you'll get this flicker rate. Some people hypothesize that, that you know, just because our eye doesn't, can't perceive it, it doesn't mean it's not having some kind of effect on us. Um, so there are, you know, there's, there's some evidence to point uh, towards it causing like a stressor on our brain. Um, to get to have this like flickering rate almost on a subconscious uh, level. So in order to um, address that, what we've got in both our panel and our mega um, is we've got what's called a constant driver. And basically it's, it's, this, uh, it's a special type of driver within your device that stores a little bit of electricity. Right, so it's what you can, Yeah, so it keeps it at a constant level. Um, so you can test that you know, either by doing a um, video, a slow motion video of your device, um, another thing, you know, we noticed as soon as we upgraded to the um, constant drivers, it's very interesting. You can unplug the light and for about two, three seconds, it still stays on and yeah. dims out. And that's just going to be some, you know, evidence to you that your device is storing energy and changing it from an alternating current to a direct uh, current. Okay. Well, that's the it. other thing you mentioned is uh, EMF. Yeah. So EMFs, it, you know, it's not uh, just one thing. The electromagnetic spectrum even includes light. You know, so technically light is EMF, mm -hmm. um, but there's certain types of EMF that are natural yeah. and there's certain types of EMF that we're not meant to be exposed to. Um, a lot of people in the light industry call it a non-native EMF. So mm -hmm. it's just, you know, things we're not used to being exposed to. So the three types that you could be concerned with, uh, one of them is uh, radio frequencies. That's things from like your cell phone, radio towers. Um, you shouldn't really be getting those from a red light uh, device except uh, if you are using one that's got like a Bluetooth timer or some kind of, you know, it's got an app to link with it. And uh, then you're going to be exposing yourself to that. And I think that is one of our um, differences between ours and our competitors. You know, we don't have any fancy um, apps or Bluetooth kind of features. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're never going to because exactly. if you your phone or, you know, you're going to, yeah, it's just not worth the, the extra risk of using that uh, kind of technology. Uh, we do have people asking for it, uh, but I think the majority of people are a bit more switched on that it's probably not a good idea to um, have like, you know, especially if you're holding the device right up against your body, you don't want to be having, um, you know, Bluetooth radio frequencies. So that's the one um, aspect. On the other end, you get um, electro, uh, electric fields, sorry, and magnetic fields. Now, both of those types of EMF uh, do arise whenever you've got uh, any kind of electron flow. So any appliance is going to emit those kind of things. Uh, to a certain degree, but you can offset them. Okay. So one of the things with an electric field is basically when a charge builds up on something. So it's a positive or a negative charge and those can attract or repel each other. Um, so a very simple way to change that is you've just got to make sure that you've got, you know, the appliance is properly uh, grounded. So if you're, you're using a core that's got a proper grounding, um, then you're absolutely fine. So our devices have that. 
Um, then the last type of one is the um, magnetic uh, fields. Yeah. And that, as soon as you have an electron uh, flow, so from uh, you know electrons moving through a device, you're going to have some kind of um, electromagnetic uh, field. Uh, so no no appliance is going to be absolutely zero um, EMF or zero magnetic field. The yeah. question the question is how far is it um, moving away? How big is that magnetic field? And that comes down to the quality of you know especially the driver that we spoke about earlier. That can be quite a big source of uh, magnetic radiation. But if you're uh, using proper housing, then you should be able to that that shouldn't um, it shouldn't dissipate over a large distance. One right. of the one of the things with magnetic radiation um, is it's very dependent on distance, and it's exponential, so it's distance squared. So if you you know you just need to move a couple centimeters away, and you're able to drastically reduce uh, the amount of radiation. So if you've got a, a device with proper housing in, I mean we've done measurements within two centimeters of our devices, you get uh, 0.75, um, I can't remember the, the measurement now, uh, UT, micro Tesla, I believe it is, um, which is the equivalent of, uh, I think it's like a, a fridge almost, or even less, it's like a, a, it's like a percentage of a fridge. Right. So if you're really close to any kind of, I think that's important is it, for people to understand, is if you're really close to any electronic device, uh, you're going to have some kind of magnetic radiation. Um, what the, the perk size, if you have a strong device, you know, such as our megas or panels, you can treat from a slight distance and you know, within two centimeters, if you're treating yourself from within a one to three inches, it's completely neg negligible and you wouldn't need to worry about that. Um, the, the big issues come to people just using poor quality parts um, in some of the red light therapy devices where you know, either it's not grounded or there's not proper housing on um, the different parts within the, um, the unit. Amazing. Okay, well, you, you've brought up, um, you've brought up three more things I'm going to ask. Well, one thing I'm going to say and two things I want to ask about. So optimal distance from body when you're, how far should we be from our devices when we're using them? And I know you talked a little bit about in the case of injury, maybe go to PubMed, look up the research, and you might get some in indication there about what's optimal for whatever it is you're trying to do. But let's just say in general terms, just for general benefits. And then the other one was about eyes, open, close. I've heard both. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, keeping your eyes, I mean, I feel like you're getting red light through your eyelids anyway, like it's so powerful. So what's your take on that? So in terms of the dosage, it can be quite dependent on what you're looking for. You know, if you're looking for skin benefits, um, the dosage is as low as 15 joules in a, ses in a session. Um, when you're looking for deeper, um, like you're targeting joints, things like that, then you can look at as high as 45 to 60 joules um, of energy within a session. And if you've got, you know, a reputable device, you'll be able to figure out, you know, you'll get the exact specs of um, how many joules that device is giving you um, at a certain distance per minute. So what we always say, and we, we, we give guidelines for this, oh, you but do. If, you wanted, if you wanted to cook a chicken in the oven, you wouldn't put it on the highest, highest setting and try and cook it in five minutes flat. And it's the same thing with red light therapy. You don't want to be going as close as you can and limit and like making that session as, as short as possible because you don't actually give your cells um, own antioxidant capability a chance to keep up. So we generally say aim for 10, 20, 30 minutes, even um, nothing, nothing really shorter than five, you know, really don't try and blast it too high. But with most devices, uh, you're not going to be getting too much exposure anyway. Um, but basically figure out, you know, if you've got, say, for instance, you want to do um, skin issues and it was like um, increase your collagen on your face and you want to be uh, aiming a red light therapy at your face and you're looking for 15 joules because, you know, that's what's um, shown in the research. You could look at one of our devices and then uh, like the panel, I believe, is three joules when it's three inches away. And you would know that within five minutes, you'd be able to do that. Or if you wanted to even go a bit further, and draw it out as, as a rough uh, rule of thumb, 10, anywhere between 10 and, th and 30 minutes is a good idea, um, but you don't necessarily need to have it uh, right up. Like right up. Face, yeah, in order to have those benefits. Great, and eyes? And eyes. So um, red and infrared light can be really good for your eyes. Um, at the end of the day, though, it depends which unit you'd be using. I mean, our mega and even our little mini uh, bulb, they're really, really strong. I don't think any bright light staring directly at it is going to be a good idea. It's like the sun. The yeah. sun at the right time of day and when you're not staring directly at it, it's good for you. But if you stare at anything that's, that's bright, it's not going to be a good idea. You don't need to specifically get glasses or goggles or anything like that to block it. 
Um, but I would just, you know, if, it, if your eyes are a bit sensitive to it, then just closing your eyes. As you mentioned, infrared light does still travel through. Oh, it penetrates, right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, if you take a, a torch that emits white light and you put that behind your hand and you shine it, what goes through, you'll see the red colors coming through. So red has that ability to penetrate through our tissue. So even if you close your eyes, um, it's going to be, you know, a bit more, you're not going to have that sensitivity, but it is going to have, still have some kind of effect. Other than that, I often find, you know, let's say for instance, I'm doing my chest, my eyes will be open anyway, and you'll get some kind of peripheral light in there. It's really not a problem. Great. Um, and you had mentioned at the beginning, I think when you and I were talking offline, that you've been FDA approved now, right? So there's, you've got that kind of stamp of approval, which is a nice thing to have. Yeah, look, it, it, look um, the FDA approves basically red light therapy as a mode of treatment. Yeah. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't fall under, you know, like it's not, it's not there to uh, replace, you know, as you're saying, cancer treatment or anything like that. But it, just because there's so much scientific uh, research behind it, um, it is, you know, clinically proven to get results. And at the end of the day, that is uh, what the FDA are looking for is things that get results. Amazing. Um, okay, well, I think that um, we've covered a lot. Oh, there was one more question from the group. We have a gentleman who is um, asking if you ship to Australia. Yes, so we do, we do free international shipping um, anywhere in the world. That's normally delivered within four to seven business days. That's amazing. Yeah. That's really impressive. Um, okay, so um, Nick, that's thank you so much uh, for all this. I think we've kind of covered a lot of ground. I think we've covered most of it, and we could probably talk again some other time about other stuff. Um, but um, but Nick, I just want to say for the people in the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Group, Nick is a member of our group. So if you have questions directly for him, I'm sure people under once I post this interview can post questions under there and you'll be able to hop on and answer. Um, and if you're watching this on YouTube and you're not a member of our group, then come on in. Uh, it's uh, biohacking superhuman performance, um, peptides, nutrition, and genetics, I think. Possibly not in that order, possibly in a different order. But um, I think that's it. Oh, and the other thing is, Nick, you were, we, we've got a great discount code for our listeners. And I think that the promo code is, uh, I think I made it our initials. So SH, super hacking bio, superhuman bio. Biohacking, biohacking is so it's BH. SHP. I think, yeah. it, I think it's just BHSH. Okay, so it's BHSH. Um, and that, what does that get people if they use that promo code? So they'll still get the free shipping and then they'll get 10% uh, off their order as well. Okay, amazing. Um, and then where can people find you other than in biohacking superhuman performance and other than the Facebook group? So on uh, Instagram, so my, my Instagram handle is uh, circadian underscore warrior. Um, and that's also the name of our Facebook group. We've also got one that's called circadian warriors. Um, and that's where we talk a lot about circadian rhythms. And obviously, you know, with the most important factor in your circadian rhythm being light, uh, yeah. that does tend to be the, the predominant um, discussion that we have. And then on Facebook and Instagram, we've also got uh, mitochondria. Uh, so that's M-Y-C-H-O-N-D-R-I-A. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, we keep, we, we post a lot of scientific uh, research around uh, those kind of things. So you're bound to find uh, something that's relevant to you there. Amazing. Well, thank you again so much for your time. Uh, we definitely went over 45 minutes, but I enjoyed the conversation. I think we covered lots and lots of ground. And uh, we'll see you in the group and uh, we'll have to chat again about deeper issues at some other time. Perfect. Thank you for having me, Natalie. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, really glad that I get to speak to uh, your great community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.